Hi, LinkedIn family. This is Jonathan from Social Me Too from Some Talented People and Potency World. I'm joined today by Rashmi Sharma and Yamil Jana and my co-creator Gregory Austin. Um, I wanted to speak to you watching this video. We're taking a new uh, stance with our Social Me Too videos. They're going to be shorter and more engaging. And I today want to speak to men that are out there on LinkedIn and other social platforms that are sending abusive messages and sexualized messages to female connections or DMs. Okay. Um, well, um, in May of uh, this year, a man uh, sent me an invite uh, to join his professional network on LinkedIn. Mm. Um, I had reviewed his profile. Uh, we had multiple connections that were mutual. He was a member of a very reputable charitable organization. And he was a successful businessman in his country. I had done the research. So based on those things, I had accepted his um, invitation and I joined his network. A few days later, he sent me um, a DM and he said that he wanted to do some business together on human rights. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted my WhatsApp number. Um, he also said something that led me to believe that he had had recent contact with the charitable organization um, that is well known. Um, and so I went ahead and gave him my WhatsApp number. Um, he established contact on WhatsApp. It was very brief, uh, the first contact, and we set up a video chat. On the first video chat, uh, we met. Uh, it was very brief. He, has, he let me know what his intentions were for, um, for the proposed business plan that he had for the human rights um, and where he wanted me to fly out to his country and do some work with him on a human rights project. And, and it was very brief and very professional. We set up a second uh, business meeting. On the second business meeting, I was uh, ready to go and phone rang and the screen opened up and when the screen opened up and I saw him, he was half naked. I, um, I froze. Oh. My, my time. vision went, I'm sorry. To give some context for our for our viewers, uh, I, Dr. Yamil is uh, a humanita humanitarian um, and uh, does uh, work in this area. So it's really speaking to her specialist area. And um, there's there's more to her story. Are you okay, Yamil? Yes. Um, my the room started spinning. I left my body at that point, um, my vision went dark, and I, I couldn't speak. Uh, I froze, I literally completely froze. Um, and my words didn't come out. For anyone who knows me and who's close to my circle, they will know that my ability to use my words and to speak my truth is very important to me. And I didn't have the ability to use my words at that point. I lost my balance temporarily. We got off the phone. Um, and I'll mention I started having flashbacks at that point. We got off the phone. Um, and it took me a few days to get my balance back. But I, I did come back a few days later to finish the business that needed to be finished. Um, and I contacted him and, and I said, I need, I would like to speak to you again, sir. 
uh, can we meet? And he said, yes. And we met by video. And he showed up half naked again. When he showed up, you know, and what I forgot to mention is that he was holding his phone and he would move it so that I could look at his entire body. Um, and he did that again the second time. And I don't know if he's, I mean, I was furious the second time. And I, I said, you know, I, it is an abuse of power for a man in your position in a, in a very reputable owner of a re very reputable business in your country to use your power, to abuse your power, um, to, to abuse your power, to seek, to, what, let me think about it, what I said, to abuse your power to get something to dangle a career opportunity in exchange to, for sexual intimacy, which was what he was attempting to do. Um, the man got dressed very quickly and he apologized. Um, then we got off the phone. Within 30 seconds of getting off the phone, he sent me a text message and he asked me for a full body picture of myself. 30 seconds it took. And I said, you know, if you're asking me for a full body picture of myself, then you didn't listen to any word that I, that I just told you. Um, and then I blocked him. And I okay, was so Rashmi, I get connection with them. This is how blind men are to this problem. I get connection requests and I don't even bother to look at their details. It's just, yeah, connect with me, whatever, try and direct sell me. I don't care because I'm not buying, so it's no worries. But the level of, of detail that Dr. J went into in, in pre- understanding and selecting that connection to take that extra step is that something you do commonly you're muted at the moment are you asking me uh, no i'm asking rashmi okay yes, yes. Uh, yeah so definitely i do lots of research before accepting my connection especially if it is coming from somebody who is who has some kind of a repute mm. like why he's sending me or is it a legit original uh, profile on LinkedIn. So I do my due diligence research before accepting it. Uh, but the, you know, no matter how much you pay close attention to, these things keeps on coming, keeps on popping up in my DM as well. And, uh, you know, and people are more sneaky. That's what the interesting mm -hmm. part is. Mm -hmm. Once you post your email in about in, in your about section, I even received images and pictures on my Gmail. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a whole narrative, whole stories, and I have numbers of those emails, which I have blocked. You know how lonely they are. They are serving in an army in a different country. They are doing this and that, and they are very, really, very, feel very alone, especially during this festival time. And there, underneath there will be a couple of maybe 10 and 20s of attachments where they have pictures. And these are so, explicit pictures. Explicit pictures and some, some pictures may be a very, uh, I don't even know if that person is is the real person because those pictures are readily available on Google. So for a normal picture, a person who is in a dressed as a military in a military uniform and holding his armors and everything, I don't know if that's the person. 
Well, it was interesting, actually, because one of our first contributors, uh, a, a, a lady called Gazelle, she said, and once she said it, it seemed absolutely obvious. She said, military forces aren't allowed to have social media. So every time you get a contact from somebody who says, I'm in the army, that is an absolute scam 100% of the time, every time. So it's a pretty intense story, uh, Yamil, uh, to dive straight in. Just tell people a little bit about what you do because your profile on LinkedIn, it doesn't have the amazing stuff about you until right at the bottom. And I think it's important that people know why you accepted that invitation. So can you just give a, a brief? Yeah, and, I'll, and I want to tell you a little bit more before I, I, but before I tell you why I accepted the invite because you, you brought up an important point. An, an important question. Do people go into that sort of detailed investigation before accepting an invite? I'd say usually not, right? Um, in Rashmi's case, in my case, yes. For me, yes, um, it's uncomfortable to receive an invite in LinkedIn. And it's even more uncomfortable to receive a request for my phone number. My blood pressure goes up when someone asks me for my phone number. It's threatening. Um, why? The people closest to me know that I am a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and and so when you have gone through that experience, you are already on, on alert. What happened when I saw the man that appeared on screen naked, that for me was a trigger. And so those will happen at times. I mean, those will happen at times. And so, so so that, that is the explanation. Now, because of those experiences and other traumatic experiences that I have been through, I have, the good thing that has come out of it is that I have had the blessing of becoming very assertive. I have developed very strong boundaries. I have developed the ability to develop a very strong voice and speaking my truth has become very important to me. That is a non-negotiable thing for me. And one of the things that I will say about survivors of sexual assault or survivors of trauma is that they are some of the most badass people I have met. Because if you are able to survive any kind of trauma, if you are able to get up from the ashes and see the light after getting hitting the hardest of rock bottoms, you know, and, and you from your experiences, from what we have discussed, you have been through diffi very difficult times. When you hit rock bottom in your life, no matter what kind of trauma it is, and you can get up, and hit and fall seven times and stand up eight, that is some kind of strength and some kind of courage and some kind of bravery that is so commendable, you know, that needs to be recognized because not everyone can do that. No. And the ability to be able to do that and get up and thrive. You're not talking about surviving and saying, you know what, I'm able to get out of bed. No, you're talking about thriving and being able to see the light and being able to look at someone and say, you know what, I made it. And no, not only did I made it, make it, I'm successful today. And I can help someone else be able to get up on their feet. And that, that is is commendable and when we are able to do that that is something to celebrate and i i i think that is beautiful so, uh, abs absolutely yeah rashmi what's your view on that 
uh, what I was saying that I agree with Yamil and because, uh, you know, people are threatened and challenged by the life challenges and small challenges, not having money, losing job, uh, going through some kind of a hardship in life and not able to realize or visualize the pain those survivors have gone through. Right. Uh, I, as a coach, I do lots of mentoring and coaching for career coaching. So I come across a very young generation, but I see that they are limited by, the, not only limited by their own thought process, they are limited by their own uh, habits and paradigms all the time. And when I try to, you know, as, as a woman, as a mother, when my motherly instincts, you know, comes out and I try to really help people, certain percentage of people will think that it's something else. And it's, it's not something else. I don't have to go and tell everybody that I just care for you because I'm your mentor or, or I'm your coach. When you say a percentage, we're talking about a percentage of men. Yes. Yes. And they are really younger to me. I'm in my 40s. I'm in my 40s and they are building their career right now. So there is a huge age difference. So that surprises me that how I always reflected back on those those situations and I and I questioned myself. Did I do something which gave them some some different perspective? This is the very point that social me too can make a difference in is that the, right so it is sexual assault if in the palm of your hand in your home you're being sent pornographic images or video chats which are um are, are are inappropriate um sorry gregor is just coming in the room uh and so the one thing we gregor and i wanted to do is for women to be able to see these stories and go oh it's not me because the conditioning that girls are brought up with still today is that they are more intelligent than boys and therefore boys are the way they are and girls clear up the mess and that kind of pattern from one extreme to another is the same story pretty much anywhere you go in the world and so you have a situation where hi Gregory you have a situation whereby the men are just they feel entitled and barriers, so you say there's a massive age difference. I guess if you feel entitled, that doesn't make a difference. Have have your have coaching customers of yours tried to date you then, Rashmi? So you are touching on those points which you know I laugh right now because you know that makes me the person who I am and I love myself. Mm. You know, uh the the irony is there are lots of people who don't know what they're doing. That's mm. how I see these days. You know, they don't know what they're doing. They don't, they are not visionary to visualize enough that what, what impact it will create on their own life. You know, it's for me, it's very easy. I can block. I can I can delete all the conversations. I have no business to look at that side. But think about a person who is doing it and getting blocked by number of women or number, number of ladies and how miserable this person is. So I always question my, I, I know it's a bigger issue, but, but I always go back because, you know, we are talking about symptoms right now. These are the symptoms we have to face, but we are not digging enough to know the root cause of the disease. Mm -hmm. Do you do you have a 
a view about what that might be. And the reason I asked that question is because um, there's a lady who's not part of our group called Zara, and she said that, and it is true that people that go on to abuse have quite often been abused themselves. And it's an issue, male rape is a taboo subject. All rape should be taboo, but male rape seems to hold a special fear for men. And I'm wondering if the bravado required to because so Yamil spoke about the strength that we develop through trauma. Now, she and I have had discussions and we've had various traumas which may or may not come out in this in this call. Rashmi, you've alluded to, you know, that losing a job or, or something like that is a significant trauma at the time because what am I going to eat? So I don't really... The very extreme sexual abuse is clearly a different category, but be, below that, I think trauma, it's experiential for the person going through it. And I don't think there's an objective measure. Gregory, you've just joined us. What, what's your takeaway so far? So that's a good, good question. And I'm kind of coming in the middle of the movie as it were. Um, so I think, and I've been giving it some thought about, it leads into some questions that I have, quite frankly. So what is it that we're looking to kind of accomplish as an organization, as a group, as a collective uh, at Social Me Too? Because obviously we can block people like Rashmi, you know, explain and so forth. Um, and there's only, I mean, we're never going to get to really solving uh, the root cause of some of these problems with people who have had traumatic experiences in their youth that's causing them to have bad behaviors now. Um, that's really, I wish there was a better solution to that. And uh, at least in the United States, just a quick aside, we don't have really adequate mental health um, opportunities to help people. Um, even people who have a, a serious, severe problem and they need a bed, there's just not beds in um, mental hospitals yeah. at all uh, to make that happen. But, but I really wanted to look into what types of changes in, in general we're looking to affect. I mean, obviously, by having these conversations, by generating awareness, by, by creating this collective, we're hoping to hopefully alter some behaviors and change some behaviors of men, maybe looking twice about how they approach women on uh, social media platforms. Um, but I recently had an experience that kind of made me scratch my head and, and ask the question, what is it that we want to change about these platforms? What, what specifically do you want to see happen, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever platform that you're on? Because uh, I had an experience very recently with LinkedIn um, where someone approached me asking me about um, you know, my marital status and then asked me how my wife's doing. And I looked at that as a, you know, as a come on, you know, she's trying to fishing trying to see it, is there, you know, is, is he available type of thing? Would you, would this you agree with that? Woman doing it to you. Yeah. Carry on. I want to hear more. Right. So, so she did. And I just said, mm, I'm not even going to respond. I, I blocked and I reported it to LinkedIn. Okay. And they went and I said, yep, this was, this is what it was. This was an unwanted advance. And they came back, investigated it. It actually came back pretty quickly within about 24, 48 hours and said, nope, nothing wrong here. Um, you can go ahead and block the person. I'm like, really? Um, so maybe they, maybe they looked at it as just a, a question, not a come on, but I took it differently. And so I don't know how they're responding to, to any other situations, but what do you, Yamil and Rashmi, think about that and how would you want the platforms to respond differently? Well, they respond the same way, Gregory. Every time I report similar ones, it's always the same response. Um, the, the one thing that I find is um, I, I get um, emails like that probably 
almost on a daily basis, maybe about four or five a day. Um, I think a lot of them are fake profiles. You know, I have kings and princes and, you know, I know that they're not looking for lives on LinkedIn. And so, and it is very frustrating. And one of the things that I think about is that there should be some kind of mechanism where, where these social media platforms should have people verify their, their identity, um, but they're not doing it. If you go to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoins and all those uh, uh, websites, they make you verify, they make you hold your ID or driver's license and they make you write crypto.com on a piece of paper while holding your, your driver's license and smiling and send them that, that picture. They make you do all sorts of things. And, I, you know, often and authenticate, uh, often, I can't say it in English. Authenticate. Okay, yeah, authenticate. Thank you. It's not my first language. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so they make you jump through hoops to be able to be on the platform. But uh, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter will not do that. And so then we end up in situations where you will have people who will um, involve, you know, will scam, will get uh, women or men involved in online love scams, will end up in involving people in human trafficking. There, There is a danger in these things. So there should be mechanisms put in place. Now, I was uh, unaware, because I don't even have a smartphone, so Rashmi, do, do, have you looked at these crypto sites? Have you had to go through a verification of who you are to be on a website? Um, no, I haven't. I haven't gone that far with crypto yet. So okay. I, I I haven't done it, but I have did it for a couple of other platforms where they want you to hold your passport because I'm not a U.S. citizen so far. So hold your passport, and you know that you are you are not robo. You are you are doing it live, so they can capture the screen and all. I have I have gone through that process, but not with the crypto. But yeah, please. No, no, please. But, you know, I, I was listening to the discussion with Greg and Yamina, uh, Yamil has shared so far. There is one more point, which one experience I would like to share. You know, I'm working on my third and fourth book. And uh, one of my connection, I was looking for some help uh, to for, you know, editing my book. So. There, uh, I posted on LinkedIn and there is one gentleman contacted me to do and I, do, I did my due diligence research on his profile and he has hundreds and hundreds of articles on LinkedIn. So that was impressive and he worked with big names which according to his profile. And we had hundreds of common connections. So it was not a person who, who was not familiar or not visible on the platform. So that's how I took it. And I was like, okay. And yet as uh, he sent me an invoice for whatever the pricing and everything for, the, for his services. And he said that, okay, if you have question, let me know, we can connect on phone. So we connected via, mm, works up because he lived in a different country. And then uh, many things happened in between and, you know, uh, he took me, a, it took me a while to figure out because I, took, I, I believed uh, in his ability to, you know, do the work I had in my hand. And I, he, I believed in the, his ability to, you know, provide me a support during, uh, during, um, during um, the book I was writing and during the project. It turned out that, you know, he did a couple of editing for free for me and he just sent his sample and he said, this is how I can do. He did one or two page of editing for, 
for uh, a document I shared with him. And then we had a good talk on, there was no red flag in the first, uh, first uh, WhatsApp call. And then later he started getting more friendly and more like a very slow progress, very slow progress. So I was not alarmed. I said, okay, maybe he, he, he was also an, you know, come from the same country I come from. So I was like, maybe he's just friendly. And um, he started talking about the person who, whom I admire or whom I follow for my spiritual path. So I thought, okay, maybe he, he is follower of the same person. So we have some, some, you know, common things going on because I also, uh, uh, take spirituality different from my religion. I don't bring spirituality and religion at the same at the same as the same concept. I practice two things very differently. So I was very very excited that somebody who understands what I want to do, what I want to write, and you know, he's giving me a good good language to frame. He understands my mindset. Couple of month, a couple of weeks uh, after that, suddenly he'll disappear. When I need some feedback, he'll disappear from the social media. Then again, he'll come back. I'm like, what is going on with this person? Oh, I was on a, some a, some assignment. Okay, then what? You are not talking to me for the project you have taken. And fortunately, I haven't paid him hundred percent. So I was I was like very very feeling safe that he's not gonna scam me for whatever the work he's not doing. Then later he started sending me things which was very different what we have agreed for and that was the time i was like i don't want to talk to you anymore because i don't think your the work the time of work you are you are now sending me is going to help me in any ways so was, I don't was this explicit to... content not really not really but it was like a trying to get more personal information, trying to get more into my kids, because, you know, when he's calling, I have two kids. So they, they, they can hear that there are kids talking around mom. So it was like, oh, you this and that. And, you know, finally, I was like, he said that you give me your personal, uh, personal uh, email. Uh, so I can, I don't want to send those content on LinkedIn. I said, okay. So I gave him my Gmail. Then I received the whole list of things, which was not, not very pleasant to see. And then, then, you know, the interesting part of it, I blogged him. I knew it, but I was just trying to get more information that to what extent he can go with me. Uh, I was like, and then, you know, the irony of this incident taught me that. I, there are a couple of good friends of mine on LinkedIn. We, we shared the same connection. So I DM them very politely that I do not have a good experience with this person. I just, as a close friend, as a, as a female, as a woman, I just wanted to let you know. And then I received that, oh, don't worry about it. From, so you, she, from your female contacts? Female contacts. And she said, oh, there are so many. How many I should block? Now you say that, yeah. And this is this this is the thing that I think, so Gregor, you're asking the question about what we want to change. And I think that, that one of the things we want to change, or certainly one of the things I am looking to change, is I'm looking to change this tuning out of entirely just disgusting behavior and women so girls it seems to be between about five and about nine something happens to a lot of girls a traumatic experience um, it may be rape and very serious sexual abuse. It may be, um, what do they call it, grooming type behavior. Um, but it's something that 
affects almost all girls and it's i think it's that that leads to this oh boys will be boys oh this is the way it is a friend of mine um an ex-friend now but um she was raped as a six-year-old and then gang raped as a 17 year old and she used the phrase we were just talking she goes i knew what men were for and her life was built then on the idea that men are only after her for sex and it affected her relationships because clearly how can you trust when someone you love someone in your family has done something like this to you Gregory. so so we were just talking about um these reviewers on on linkedin who are looking at these cases and then deciding whether or not to to take any type of action and regardless of the content it seems like uh they they go ahead and just dismiss it and Emil was saying just like some judges just dismiss these you know these cases of sexual harassment because they they lack education and what it actually is what's the definition and so forth um i was arguing a couple things in addition to that that one, the younger generations, you know, with the media and everything that they're they're seeing on on TV, movies, and so forth, they're so desensitized to it um, that it's just that's just normal behavior. And and secondly, there's no incentive for the platforms to take action. I think they're fearful. We don't want to lose membership or you know cause you know any any waves. What if it's one of our you know biggest influencers, or what if it's a you know someone who's you know doing something that's you know contributing money to the company, um, we don't want to lose these people over, you know, a, a question, you know, that they don't consider something to be as serious as it is. So they just sweep everything under the rug as a policy and pretend like they're doing something. They just say, oh, you can block them. And then that's the only solution. Well, I, go on. Which, which doesn't give any, you know, any feedback to the person because if you block someone, um, it doesn't, it doesn't they don't know that. No. And that's fine. I mean, you should have the, the, the option of anonymity. But you should also have a button that says, I'm blocking you because you're inappropriate. Right. And, and, and you need to know that feedback. Well, there are no no go on, you, Mel. Yeah. And there are no consequences. Mm -hmm. The problem persists, you know, and continues to escalate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're mentioning yeah. the whole identity thing. I think it's a brilliant idea having to prove who you are. But, you know, I, I look at it from a realistic perspective. LinkedIn or other pro, um, platforms aren't going to do that because it's going to cost way too much money. And unless they're forced to by law or the fear of litigation, then they're probably not going to spend the dollars on it. Do you, right, so do you guys think, uh, I'm new to all uh, online media of all sorts, so my understanding was that Facebook specifically was you had to be the real person, it was only a, so obviously someone could set up as a, as a fake account, but generally speaking people are supposed to be who they are. Facebook people have, I will tell you, there are accounts under my name on Facebook. So yeah. there are a few mm -hmm. accounts under so do we think because i don't i'm not sure that there are humans reviewing these cases because i told a story on a on a uh, an earlier recording that there's a tv uh, radio uh, dj in this country on a talk radio show and he was relaying a story so in the uk in um in October, and a member of parliament, uh, a member of Congress, from your point of view, was murdered. And at the time, they looked at the social media aspect of his killer and the things that, that they put up. And the idea that there's actual humans reviewing decisions, I think, is probably it might be that we've got a generational bias because supposing we're we're three people four people in a room and each of us have said yeah we've had to block someone and each of us have reported someone 
and it doesn't come back. And this James O'Brien, he gave a story. He said that he got a tweet, and in the tweet, it was a picture of his front door, which they got off Google Street View by, you know, uh, understanding his address and what have you. And he sent a report to Twitter and said, you know, this happened. He was fairly jovial about it because he's a shock jock of sorts. And they wrote back after about four or five weeks and they said it doesn't breach our terms and conditions. And this disregard, if it was a person doing it, you go, this person has no empathy. They are literally a sociopath. Right. So are big tech sociopaths employing sociopaths or are the algorithms now only interested in their uh, set agenda which is to gain engagement hmm. rashmi what's your view exactly i agree with that point of view which says that engagement is everything because with every click they make money you know they don't I have a couple of people known personally who have multiple accounts on Facebook. And I never got to understand and never had interest in to what they do with the other accounts. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why they have two or three accounts on Facebook, unless you are logged out for some reason and it's, 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 they have taken down your profile or something for some other reason. I don't see that a person should have a three or four account on the same platform. But how can I have, there is no mechanism. It says that there is no mechanism to verify who this person is or how this person can have four different accounts to do four different things on, online. And right. Twitter takes it to another level. I'm sorry to, to, to interject yes, of course. because you can, <laughs> like, for example, Jonathan, if you were a, a very famous person and millions of people knew about you, I guarantee you there'd be a Twitter account for Jonathan's beard. That, that kind of thing happens. And so it's, it's kind of funny, right? Comical and so forth, but it just means that it's, it's so open. And I think these platforms, they, they're more concerned with freedom of, of speech and expression and lack of censorship than protecting individuals. Please continue, Rashmi. You know, uh, Greg, you, you said it so rightly that they are not there to protect us. They are there, mm -hmm. there to make money. And that's all, that's all they care about, you know, selling our, if you are, if you are not uh, good or not tech savvy enough to understand the setting features of your social media accounts, your data will be sold. Right. And lots of lots of company uh, people, millions and millions of accounts, they don't even know how to set their privacy. Right. And all the data gets sold. And that's how that's a passive income for a, all the uh, social media company. On that very point, actually, um, uh, Malia from uh, a previous recording was saying that you have to disconnect so when it says sign in with facebook or sign in with google that's how they end up linked to all the apps on your phone and anywhere there's a a gap or a block or anything that makes your information on that app visible they then could dive into all of your cookies and history and get all of your data and it, it's um data harvesting i think is the term so <sighs> We started off with Greg asking what we wanted to happen. And I had an idea that I wanted to have this, have these discussions be viewed by as many um, women as possible so that they can literally go, oh yeah, me too, rather than, oh, what did I do to make this happen? But now that you talk about this authentication requirement, that doesn't require a person to do it, an AI could do it. Mm -hmm. 
So it doesn't seem to me to be something which is prohibitively expensive to do. Yamil, what's your view on this? I mean, I, I think even if it if we're talking about saving people from potentially being trafficked, saving people from online scams, which fraud, we're talking fraud and saving people from losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Even if it went into the, it's gonna cost these companies money. Well, we're talking about saving lives and saving people from fraud. So, okay, it costs money. These agent, these companies like crypto.com, for example, they do, they go through these lengthy processes. And I actually wrote down, it's like a seven step process. That's incredible. I mean, it's incredibly lengthy, but brilliant. And I don't, I don't know why these other social media platforms don't, don't, um, don't have them. The authentication process, the, the uh, uploading the um, driver's license or passport, the selfie. I mean, they make you go jump through hoops. It's important. You're talking again, catfishing and, and, and putting people through all these, uh, like I mentioned, all these um, traumatic experiences. So why are we not going through these? Why are we not forcing these social media platforms to do it? Why is, why are they not laws? Well, I, I uh, referred to an earlier recording. I referred to an article about, uh, so you, you all three of you are over the US side. I'm the only one in the land of tea and crumpets, but um, it's a singer from the US called Lizzo. Do you know the singer? So there was a story on on uh, BBC technology page. That's no, it was uh, and yeah, yeah it was, no, sorry, it was entertainment and arts. Anyway, so this singer had had some, as all people of color or all women, anyone frankly, but as a woman of color and also a plus size woman, she'd received loads of abuse. I don't even know how much on one of her posts. She had complained to Facebook. They took her posts down. So I, I saw that and I went, oh, so it's not that you can't do it. It's that you won't do it unless the risk to you is higher than the not doing anything about it. So, Rashmi, you look poised to speak. Yeah, uh, you know, I kind of uh, experienced and... Uh, sometimes very, very uh, disheartening for me personally that there are people on one hand who are experienced the extreme abuse, who have experienced uh, something which we can, a normal person cannot even imagine. And there are some people on the other hand whom you try to safeguard and they are not ready to acknowledge the threat. And all in between these two extremes, social media, any platform, let, let alone Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or even Instagram, Pinterest, anything you name it, they are thriving. They, there is, they are not, not uh, you know, no law or no safety features have imposed on them to make it authentic as a person. Where And when Yamila is telling about the crypto incidents, crypto requirement to be a part of that community, you have to be a real person. Is that a minimum requirement on any social media? No, no. And that's what I always talk about the root cause. The crypto, you know, at one point of time, it was on LinkedIn. Your DMs will be full with the Bitcoin and the crypto and the Bitcoin miners and no matter like a financial advisor or financial this or that, 
I had n number of messages in past. But crypto wanted the the branding of crypto as something different than any any other thing whatever existed on this planet so far. So crypto had its own community. It's not easy to intrude or to become a part of that community. Whereas in social media, they want everyone to be on their platform. That's the two different mindset here. It's um, it's quite um, disconcerting, actually. I'm reading a book at the moment called Genius Makers, which looks at the way AI took off in the last sort of six years mm -hmm. with all your sort of voice assistants and all the rest of it like that and they i read a story in a book in 2010 that facebook on the basis of five likes can tell you your um voting choice republican or democrat just on five likes and so this thing about all data from from an ai point of view you're quite right all data as much as much as as they can possibly gather to train the ai is all they're interested in but the trouble is if they're training the ai with this horrific acidic abusive death threats and leading to actual deaths from social media you know, people that have committed some crime. There was that thing in America where they're driving into the parade this weekend. Um, the, the people that perpetrate these crimes more often than not have been saying things on social media for a period of time leading up to the crime. So the question then, yeah. the question then is if they really don't, If they really don't, mm, how can I phrase this? Okay, so everyone I've said about social to me too, too, that is a woman goes, oh yeah, that's a really good idea. A few of my male friends, not all of them, but a few of them have gone, oh yeah, well, what about privacy? And what about freedom of speech? And what about, you know, I want to receive jokes of my friend about, you know, animal porn or whatever it might be. I want to receive this sort of thing. I don't want I don't want my communications to be censored. And I say to them, no, it's it's not about you engaging in a conversation that's two way. It's about a woman puts out an opinion on any social media platform at any level of academia or life and they are pretty routinely trolled straight away and so i'm not asking i don't imagine that social media companies should uh censure free speech but if grammarly can work out in the middle of a sentence whether or not it's in the right syntax then ai could recognize someone writing a dm or a message to unsolicited because the abusive words there's not that many of them so the only context in which that would possibly be acceptable is if it's a to and fro so I said, well, this is the idea I had in my head, and I know nothing about computers, but I said, well, we don't see the same feeds as other people. You could be sat next to three people, all looking at LinkedIn or wherever it is, and we'd all have different feeds, yeah, because of our interests and likes and what have you. So it seemed to me that you could allow the horrible man to get his thing out, get his horribleness out of him and he could send it and he could be shown your wall with his comment on but you would not get it and it would not go on any other wall apart from the one that he sees but the danger of that is that if they then find out it might escalate their behavior what are your views 
Yamil? See, I, my views is you can create any kind of persona and hide behind a computer if it's not you and you're pretending you're someone else and act more vile and create more violence and destroy another human being and lead that person to suicide. That's, there's, there's so many dangers behind the not being you and in hiding behind being someone else that can create danger. And this is where we're living in a society where there's this severe bullying, where people are hiding behind computer screens and behind these keyboards and creating so, more da so much damage, where we have so much suicide, you know? Um, and why are there no consequences? Why is there this, oh, well, it's gonna cost money for, for us to verify. Well, it should, so then it costs money. Why are there no consequences? You know, um, there should be, we need to be responsible as a society, as a world, we need to be responsible for ensuring that we take care of our people because we are connected to each other and we need to ensure that we take care of each other. So we need to, consequences. You know, Rashmi made a very good point earlier is, and, and I don't recall her exact words, but we, we are not, and I really don't recall her exact words, but we are not, there are no consequences. We are not ensuring that we're taking care of the person next to us. Um, without consequences, there is gonna be no change to behavior. If you can, if I let you get away with the way that you treat me, you will continue doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, and I'll, and I'll bring up, I, and I wanted to go back to a point that you made earlier about women or men or being abused as children um, when they're six years old, seven years old, and then how they grow up and then believe that people will do that and that's just the way they are. And, and it doesn't always need to be that way, you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why and I'll, and I'll bring my sexual assault for, for example, um, because if I was able to heal that, everyone else can heal that and we can learn from each other. One of the things, um, and I'll, and I'll give, if, if you allow me to, I'll, I'll give my experience, um, one of the things that came out of my experience with sexual assault and that I know that if I did it, everyone can do it, is that I had, not only did I grow with gaining my voice and my ability to speak, but one of the things that I had to do was take an inventory of my life and take a look at the people that were in my life and a really, it was like a life review. Who is in my life that belongs in my life and who doesn't belong in my life? Who is contributing to my life and who, who is not? So um, who empowers me? Who uplifts me? Who tears me down? Who disempowers me? And then you start having to cut people out of your life that tear you down, that make you feel less than, that make you feel devalued, that make you feel like you don't belong. And one of the things that I learned is that you can love someone and still choose to say goodbye. You can miss someone every day and still be glad that they are no longer in your life. And when you start cutting people from your life, whether they're family members that are toxic, whether they're people that have been in your life for a long time but make you feel depleted, that is a life changer. And your life starts shifting. And then you start replacing that with people that empower you and uplift you and are positive. Your life it completely changes. And that is information because that's how we learn how to get out and up from the ashes. And so if some of us can do it, everyone can do it. And it's about helping each other. Well, here's my um, 
caveat on that because you and I, different types of trauma, but we both had trauma. Um, I don't speak for Rashmi or for Gregory. I don't know what you've been through in your lives, but um, we've had to, Yamil. We've had to. We had no choice. Well, you could choose to languish in the gutter and be a victim. But if you want to, as you say, live and thrive, not just survive, survival is for unfortunate people in, in developing economies where it's hand to mouth food, you know, um, anyone in a developed economy that isn't, isn't um, actively trying to become better is, is, is wasting an opportunity they don't even realise the, the gift of. But can someone who's not had a severe trauma because you have to be at the bottom before you realize you can climb out again or or sometimes sometimes you have to hit rock bottom too yeah sometimes so, it takes that rock bottom so well, although me, everyone, yeah so although everyone can and the tools and the mindset and Rashmi coaching and changing beliefs and looking at how you represent things inside your mind are amazing tools for psychological and cognitive change. But as a rule, sorry Rashmi, I was going to say as a rule, the change is being done to people that you're coaching. So they don't have a choice. Does that make a difference in your experience, Rashmi? You know, I, I kind of agree. There are two, three things which I heard in past five, 10 minutes of discussion I would like to highlight. First thing, before I forget, I want to mention you one very important point you mentioned uh, uh, about how Grammarly identify your errors through AI and correct you then and there, which the social media is not able to do it. And I, I use, I'm a premier member of Grammarly because I do a lot of writing. So uh, I, I would bring to your point as a coach and a, as a person who have studied mind to a certain extent, you know, AI, as the name says, it's an artificial intelligence. So you have to put some intelligence into it artificially. So Grammarly, because it, it focuses on your errors in your language when you are writing, they embedded that intelligence artificially there. But somebody who is using a foul language on social media, the intelligent people of social media forget to artificially induce that vocabulary there. So it's a choice. It's a choice. They don't want to stop that. No, for no reason. They don't want to stop that. Because if you're writing a bad language, you will see thousands and thousands of comments underneath that post. That's that. That's the cash for them. Yeah. And, you know, and the second point, which Yamil mentioned, that sometimes you have to hit the rock bottom. Right. But to learn the lesson and to teach the right thing, not everybody has to to feel the pain. Not everybody has to hit that rock bottom. We should have that empathy. And, and mind you, it's it's different than sympathy. Too bad it's happened with you. It's 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 much way beyond that sympathetic level. You should have that empathy to understand and to be open to learn and create that awareness around you. Be a part of that community that gives and empowers people to speak up. I read an article a couple of months back where. Uh, a South, um, in a, a, some African country uh, in the continent, the young girls, young girls has to go for a sex to get a sanitary napkin. How dehumiliating is that? 
how what that's what i am t talking about what we are seeing these things these examples or these survivors those are the symptom how we can fix that at the societal level you know the one thing our education system did is deleted that deleted that history from our mind on the name of development and new policy new education system and detached us from our history you know if we go back and see things what happened in past and what le lesson it carries still carries us for us that's huge but history is treated as something which is not going to take you anywhere in life that you cannot make it out of a, a career reading history because we wanted uh you know we wanted to have a society of a worker not a human being who can think behave and live independently and that's that's the that's the big big reason we never bring history historic you know couple of countries does couple of countries is still far behind you know talking about what experiences like we all have a his, history is full of full of traumas yeah history is full of traumas so why can't we learn from there because we don't want to learn from that we want to keep the status quo we, we we want to you know market our miseries package it in a you know not in a, in a hershey chocolate bar but as a ferrero rocher and serve it is in a different way you're nodding away there gregory there's i mean that, that's the rub is how do we change people how do we change society how do we control it and one of the views that i had um recently is my mantra is to be a force for good um, because I think it's easy to take the binary perspective, point the finger, be mad. Yep, you're wrong. That's all, you know, point at them and say this person's wrong. And I struggle with that because you know, these platforms aren't going to do anything unless they absolutely have to. Because they're focused on their revenues and they don't want to do anything that's going to harm their revenue. So do we take matters into our own hands? And if so, what would that look like? How would we, you know, we identify someone who is doing something inappropriate or wrong. What's the best approach? You know, and, you know, the kind of the justice and anger side of me wants to point them out and say, you did this and we're exposing you for that. And sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes it creates, and that's where the Me Too, you know, movement got started. And it actually did change some, some things. Um, but is that going to have a, a ripple effect in, in a direction we don't necessarily want to go? Um, the way I look at it is three things. One, strategically encouraging those people who are doing really, really good things and loving on them and, and building them up. Secondly is educating folks who, and maybe that's part of holding them accountable. It's like, well, let me educate you first. Now, let me help you understand there's another perspective and this is what your behavior is doing or causing or harming, right? And then if that doesn't help or if they're too ignorant or too stubborn to change, then you hold them accountable in some kind of way. Um, and I think those are some of the, the things that we can do. But what do you all think we, you know, let's say we identified somebody who was doing something um, and we wanted it to stop and LinkedIn isn't going to do anything about it. What do you think we should do? You know, from my perspective, I think... Uh, these things unless we we create a community where we say that we are strongly holding each other and saying that either a male or a female you are not alone everybody is a part of that community because most of the time these these people these behavior uh i'm not saying that men are not facing men are, men are also facing some kind of abuse some kind of a different situations and i'm very aware of that but when they see that this is a group of equally empowered both gender they 
they are some kind of a resistance comes in and they see that they cannot do this with this group. But when they feel that there is only a female or only a male left alone, mm -hmm. they are more likely to come for it. I can actually, oh, sorry. Yeah, please. Well, I was just going to say, um, uh, one of our supporters who I tag into our messages um, sent me a screenshot earlier today um, of a DM she'd received. And I said, just write back and, and copy in social me too. And she did. And the bloke goes, oh, no, sorry, this won't be good for my computer and um, block, uh, blocked her as a connection. So there is already some value we're getting a few stories gregory and i we've been privy to a few great stories from gazelle and from malia who was on the earlier shows but it's so small at this stage and i i'm i'm so aware that this is happening every day to millions and millions and millions of people let's not even call them men and women millions of people are being abused and yes, it does happen the other way around, but online, most of the bile is targeted towards women. So if we could get this to become internationally recognized, then, then we could get a community of, of, of women and men, people who've had trauma, who have, who can offer the insights to people that are just experiencing it, that would be but how do we get to that point yeah so we got to grow and and so forth and i don't know i think we we need a growth strategist to help us out who, who are really good at these these types of things um and and maybe even having some type of a reasonable marketing strategy that makes sense for, for who we are and what we want to accomplish um and maybe we get so big at one point we could create our own uh linkedin where people do have to verify who they are. <laughs> well, listen, um, I am waiting for the website. So I bought the domain name Social Me Too, and I'm waiting for this company to produce a website for me. And that website is based on a website that was launched in the UK called everyonesinvited.uk. And that on that website, this woman came on BBC Breakfast News and she reported that she was a, a survivor of in-school sexual assault. And the website was set up and the way it works is that you can leave your... Um, uh, survivor testimonies anonymously so here you ladies have stepped up and you've put yourself out there even though you're going to get trolled for this appearance but once the website is up then i'm hoping that because you can leave your stories anonymously we can gather many 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 millions more and from there say okay now we're speaking for a lot of people but yeah a growth strategy now gregory i, I explained to the two ladies before you arrived that we'd had that conversation and and, and mm. thought the 10 minute videos because you didn't actually say it about our videos you just said i haven't got time to watch videos 10 minute video on linkedin i'm doing things mm. And on the basis of that, we're going to do an experiment. So the experiment will be that um, I'll have the long form of this interview. So the uncut, unedited, not, not unedited because I'll put a top and tailor on it, but the long form version I'll upload to YouTube. I'll still do the segments but as we draw our conversation to a close today i want the two ladies to look down the barrel of the camera and make a statement to either other women to the men that are doing it however whatever whatever you want to say but a 90 second two minute is much more likely to be watched because I think, especially on this top person ambassador scheme, you get the alleged viewing figures, but people aren't really viewing them. Um, do you know about the top person ambassador, Rashmi? Yeah. Yeah. So you get you get clicks and views, but they're not real. 
um, and we've been fighting, struggling to get above 700 um, members of our page for months. Hasn't moved. We did a little bit at the beginning, but nothing, nothing major since then. So, um, what else should we cover? <laughs> should we cover um, in the in the discussion? Other points, Yamil, what would you, what else, is there anything else you'd like to bring out? Because obviously we'll have more than one conversation like this, so you haven't got to remember everything. No, I haven't gotten to everything. No. Um, no not in nearly. No. We have many more. Yeah. So you want us to do... 90 seconds. Don't worry about the timing. Don't worry about the timing. Just it's a statement from yourself looking into the into the lens of the camera so that the person, so from a viewer's point of view, you're looking at them. Because that's the difference, I think, is it's the connection with other survivors that I think is going to help break through. I think it's going to be another woman looking into your eyes that's going to go, oh yeah, me too. And that's what, I, what I'm trying to get. So um, like I'm- PSA style, public service announcement style. Yeah. Like so, is, you know, yeah. so I'm happy to go first. A statement to men or to women? So, uh, to whoever you want to communicate with. Because ultimately, there are the, the, the men need to change, but we know that that change is societal, and we know that the uh, sexualization is happening in children younger and younger and younger, and therefore we know that it's going to get worse before it gets better on our current trajectory. Um, so I can go first if you like um and do a do a uh, have yeah. a go and then you can uh, so i'll go first gregory next and so we'll do one we'll do a, a a piece to camera each time all the contributors so let me just go to uh speaker view <clears throat> uh or actually i'll just re-record the intro from earlier <clears throat> 